Good evening and welcome to McLean's Live. I'm Paul Wells, senior writer for McLean's Magazine. Uh, and uh, everything is strange and weird. I'm, I'm talking to you from my living room. Uh, I have uh, um, uh, put on a wristwatch and my show business glasses for the first time in two months. Um, and uh, every, we're just going to kind of make it up as we go along here. Uh, but I think we're going to have a really good conversation. You know, we've been doing this for um, two years uh, live in front of audiences at the National Arts Centre. Uh, thanks to our sponsors and uh, and uh, consistent support from the Canadian Bankers Association, who are also uh, helping to bring you this show tonight, and we thank them very much. Um, and it's actually kind of a lot easier to do it live. I, I can see people's reaction. Uh, I know when uh, the conversation is uh, connecting with people and when it isn't. Um, but, of course, we're all keeping our distance one from another, uh, and that's going to continue for a while. So we decided we're going to start this series right back up. We're going to be here, uh, you know, if everything goes well, every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Eastern for as long as it takes uh, to keep bringing you conversations about these strange new circumstances, public policy, life uh, and society. And um, I have to say that our team uh, at McLean's was a little surprised when they said, you know, let's do this. Let's uh, start these conversations up again. Let's get into really heavy, meaty conversations about uh, the pandemic and social isolation and all of that stuff. And I said, yeah, that's great. Let's start with an artist. Let us uh, start with uh, Stephen Page, founding member of the Bare Naked Ladies, uh, who has been getting ready to uh, premiere his new musical at the Stratford Festival. And like so much else uh, that's going on, uh, that was supposed to be going on this summer, that has been postponed indefinitely. Um, uh, it makes as much sense to, for me to start there as anywhere else. Um, uh, all of us miss being with other people. All of us miss uh, human contact, um, social events, uh, the performing arts, and that's as much a part of the conversation as the economy or parliament or anything else. We are absolutely going to get going, going to get around to all that other stuff. As a matter of fact, my guest next week will be Alberta Premier Jason Kenney. Um, but uh, my guest tonight, I, I couldn't be more delighted, is Stephen Page. Stephen is talking to us from his home just outside of Syracuse, New York. How are you doing, Stephen? How are you doing, Stephen? I'm well. How are you, Paul? Very good. Uh, thanks for doing this. Um, uh, as good a place as any to start is for you to ex uh, describe for us the very busy winter you just completed and the very busy summer you were going to have and what happened in between. In between. Yeah, well, I, I toured um, the last album that I put out uh, for almost, I guess, a year and a half. So we toured uh, all over the UK a couple times, several US tours and uh, Canada. And we finished up in January with... Um, uh, we did a bunch of shows on the East Coast and some in Western Canada in uh, smaller markets, which was just awesome. And it was a great kind of energizer getting ready to go into rehearsing for the, the premiere of um, Here's What It Takes, the musical I wrote for Stratford. And so we went into Stratford uh, beginning of March and started our rehearsals. And we were just getting into the groove and making this thing feel like a real show I mean, we've been working on this thing for seven years and musicals take forever to to put together and you know know if they're actually even going to get produced and here we are it's actually going to happen and then i guess it was probably friday the 13th they said showed up at, at rehearsal and they said go home today and we'll figure out what's happening here and uh you know we waited through the weekend and uh you know several days later they finally said no go home home um, cause it's going to be a while, but even then we didn't know what that meant. Like we didn't know, are we going to be back at work in three weeks and we're going to lose a couple weeks of previews or are we going to lose some of the performances? And it just kept getting chipped away and chipped away until finally last week. Um, they've, you know, officially postponed the season, whatever that means. Like the whole season is not happening right now. And, uh, you know, the, the waiting in between now and that, begin you know middle of march has just been you know unbelievable not just for me but for everybody involved with the whole festival it's funny i remember i remember i think that friday or no the friday before so friday the uh 6th of march i did my last pundit panel on uh cbc with vashi capellos and i said 
I mean, you know what's going to happen is that the Calgary Stampede is going to be cancelled and the Montreal Jazz Festival and all, all of these events that are the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival, all these events that have kind of been a touchstone of my uh, life as a, as a, as a fan. Um, and uh, even as I was talking, I thought, you know, the, the economic scale of it is going to be really substantial. These are events that draw tens or hundreds of thousands of people. And uh, and then, um, even as I was talking, I realized the social impact of it. Um, we're going to miss, we are missing all of this opportunity to interact with colleagues, other artists, audiences. Uh, what has that been like for you since, you know, since you first realized that, that was coming at you and now that you've had to live with it for a couple of months? Months. Well, when it first started happening, like, I, I guess the, 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 touchstone for me would be the moment that they canceled South by Southwest, similar kind of thing. And that was, you know, an early cancel and started to think, oh, this is really going to affect us because you started to see it happening in pockets. And it was in that week before they sent us home when we're at rehearsals and, you know, there's hand sanitizer on every table and we're taking breaks to wash hands and people are not touching when they're doing choreography. And like, we didn't know. It feels so quaint now thinking about it there was this kind of creeping dread inside of it. Uh, this of it, the, the public health scale, um, and that becomes difficult. And then you go home. And for me, the interesting thing for me is that coming home the first couple of weeks was kind of like normal life for me. Because when I go um, on tour, I come home at the end of a tour and I kind of just lay around for a week or two. And so it just kind of felt like a tour ended. And I hadn't fully processed, because I was still waiting to go back to work, um, I hadn't fully processed what that meant. And that kind of, I, you know, for me, I always struggle. Day saying, you know, you should tell some more stories in between the songs, and like you know, more in depth. And I, the entertainer in me, is always so intent on keeping the show going and keeping people engaged um, that I'm afraid of losing people. And you know, on your screen with all these little, you know, other other screens of people, you can't really get that sense of connection. But there is something else that you can't get, like doing even like this, a Facebook stream type thing, is you know, the people singing along, you can see them singing, you can see them living their lives in their living rooms. And that's an amazing sense, not just for me, but for the audience to see each other and connect that way. It's been a huge help for me. And I think people are, I, at least I found one way to kind of keep going and keep busy and keep busy. What are you hearing from other musicians? Well, some people are just kind of hunkering down and doing doing their thing, like when making a record. But remember, records don't make revenue for artists anymore. They're a vehicle in order to get out on the road. Like a promoter often won't book you, even if you haven't had a hit in 20 years, they won't book you unless you have something new. Um, mm. it, Cause they see it as being part of this uh, uh, promo and publicity cycle. Um, so you kind of have to keep producing that way. And then obviously as an artist, you need to keep producing because that's who you are and it's what you do and you're hopefully growing and changing and you have things you want to say. Um, so I know a lot of people who are doing that, working on finishing their albums. It's kind of like the the meme we keep seeing about uh, people finishing their novels in, in um, lockdown. And I keep meaning to get to that part. Like I have a lot of songs on the go, but thankfully I've been busy with other stuff. Um, 
but uh, I do worry I'm not I'm gonna have nothing to show for this when this is over. And I get that from a lot of artists, like the sense of like, what do I have to show? I've been waiting, and then we don't know what's next. And because we don't know what's next, and we assume what people are telling us is that the performing arts will likely be the last or one of the last things to open back up fully. And even when that happens, who knows if audiences are going to want to come? I mean, I know they crave the connection and they crave, they crave the exposure to live, live art. There's nothing like being in the room with it when it's happening. And, uh, but people are afraid and we don't know what, you know, what's happening. So we book stuff far in advance. Um, so my, you know, my summer tour that was planned, it wasn't announced yet, but it was planned months ago, I assume is gone. And I'm, you know, even if it, if they open stuff back up, would I want to go out and do it? I'm not sure. But when they do start booking things again, they book so far in advance and think about all those in my, in, in my discipline, all those touring acts who are playing clubs or theaters all around the world um, and have had to have shows uh, either canceled or postponed. So they're, they're going to be first in line to rebook those shows a year from now, let's say. Um, and then anybody else who's been making music and what needs to get out, wants to get out on the road is going to have to get in line behind those people in order to get into venues. So for a lot of people, it's going to be not just a year before they're actually doing shows. It could be a year and a half or two years for some of them. And I think that's really scary for, well, for me and for a lot of people. I think every everybody I know in the performing arts is working through all of the implications of all of this, slowly coming out around to the the realization that this is not their spring that's shot. This is uh, um, uh, a, a, a seismic thing. There's opportunity in it, but but it's it's going to take a lot of adjustment. Now, one of the things that you did uh, kind of when you realized that you're going to be settling in for a while was you wrote a new song about this situation. And you recorded it, and we're actually going to see the video. What is? Can you set up this video that we're going to see? Sure. So this is while I was still up at Stratford, waiting to know whether or not we were going to go back to to uh, work or not, and you know, frantically scrolling through social media and news sites and texting friends and so on. And you know, this is when things started to kind of get real. And uh, Tom Hanks was was and Rita Wilson were diagnosed and so on, which was, I think for a lot of people were like, oh, this is actually like ours now in a way. Um, and that was, which is a weird thing to think about it that way. But I think in a pop culture way, um, it was just part of the litany of stuff that was going on. And so I sat and very quickly wrote this song, which is a, it's, it's a, a mix of kind of uh, bemused glee, bewilderment, uh, fear, and, uh, and hope and a joy in a, in kind of, to, uh, looking for some connection. So I wrote this song very quickly, set up my iPhone on the table and filmed it and put it up on YouTube. And then a few days later, Craig Northey and Kevin Fox, the two guys who play with me in the uh, Stephen Page trio, both recorded themselves playing along with my YouTube video. And uh, Craig's son quickly pet edited it together and we put that up and that's what you're gonna see. Okay, so let's run that video. The name of the song is Isolation. Uh, for obvious reasons, here's uh, the Stephen Page trio. Everybody with the 
Let's uh, pick that up again. Uh, you missed all the good stuff. Uh, we went back to the early days of the Bare Naked Ladies. Uh, I told my own life story uh, because I like to be irrelevant. And um, and then we found out that we didn't have any audio. But you know, um, that whole actually, time, that whole time I sang Ness and Dorma. Yeah. Did, Paul did the whole uh, always be closing bit from uh, Glenn Gary and Ross. It was amazing. Yeah. Not that long ago, I actually hosted a national. Uh, leaders debate in the middle of an election campaign and the prime minister didn't show up. So uh, ever since then, nothing worse can possibly happen to me. I'm free. I'm like Thelma and Louise. So uh, we're just going to we're just going to uh, pick up the pieces. Um, uh, Stephen, you were talking about um, kind of realizing that Bare Naked Ladies was actually a thing. What was that like for you? A lot and tried to figure out some songs, went up and sang and then won the battle of the bands. And then at that point, it was kind of no turning back and being kind of we were 18 year old boys and thought, uh, you know, we loved this and we couldn't admit it. Everything was about jokes. So be, it was our fake band really. And then as we started doing shows, people started coming and people we didn't know, like that, you know, you'd see a lineup outside of a club and go, I, the, I didn't go to school with these people. And then that's when we kind of realized it was a thing. And at that moment, you're our, our sense of, who we were kind of shifted, like not our sense of like our, our image or who, you know, where we came from, but as a band, um, you know, we started sending off demo tapes to every record company out there. And I think assumed that we would just get signed and have a number one hit. And of course, nobody wanted us. And most of the Canadian labels just saw us as a novelty, goofy one hit thing. We thought we were more than that. Like, I think we felt like we were a mix of, Kind of contemporary pop culture and 60s folk and folk rock and, and and harmony singing and comedy and all those things mixed together um and canadian labels didn't see it so we just kind of despite them almost would show up at things and just kind of get out there and try and get on much music or cbc or cf and wide radio in toronto and uh and the, as soon as we could afford to rent a van we got in a van and just toured coast to coast to coast as much as we could because we also wanted to be a Canadian band and not a Toronto Queen Street um, part of this kind of you know we didn't want to be part of that or seen as part of that niche we wanted to be seen as something for the whole country so when the first album came out Gordon it became huge in Canada um, which you know as you were kind of alluding to earlier made huge fans out of a lot of people and uh, haters out of a lot of others and it took a while, but, you know, after a couple years or three years or so of touring that around Canada, we had kind of cleaned it out. We'd kind of um, saturated the marketplace and second record came out and Canadians, it was still a hit. You know, we had songs like Jane and Alternative Girlfriend on that and so on, but it wasn't the hit that the previous record was. And Canadians can be fickle sometimes about their uh, affections towards their own artists, particularly. Um, 
so we started touring in the U.S. more, basically out of necessity, just because there there are so many more towns and cities to play in that you could play a different place every night and not play to the same audience. And then it just kind of grew and grew and grew under the radar um, for about four or five years in the U.S. until we, you know, had a big international hit with with the stunt album. I remember seeing you at the National Arts Center uh, in Ottawa in 96 or 98 uh, at a, you know, essentially your American and your Canadian careers were kind of out of sync. So the NAC was not full that night. Uh, and yet you were on Conan O'Brien about every two weeks in those in those days and, 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 and really tearing it up in the States. It was a it, it was an odd moment. And then, you know, uh, thankfully, the two the careers synchronized and you were not as big a deal in either country. Uh, <laughs> That's what happens. <laughs> and then suddenly you're out on the street, sort of, so to speak. I mean, you, the, 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 there was a decision made uh, for a bunch of reasons in 2009 uh, that you would no longer be part of the band. Right. And I bet that I get the impression that listening to your music that that threw you for a loop. Yeah, I think it did. I think, you know, you know, it was something that, that had certainly been in my mind for a time before. But I think, you know, every breakup is difficult. You know, I was I went through a divorce the year before that. And that was as easy as you try to make it and amicable as you try to make it. It's always painful. It's the same kind of thing here where it's like, OK, we'll make this quick and clean. And it never ends up being that way. 20 people, and we really were family for all that time. And then all of a sudden, you're not family with them anymore is hard. Um, And then, you know, you try and do your own thing. And musically, that's what got me through it all. I mean, got me through. It wasn't just about career and what's the next step and how do I climb back up or whatever else, because making music and the kinds of people that I got to make music with and continue to get to make music with um, made that part worth doing every day. Um, you did this album with the Art of Time Ensemble, which is a, a sort of a, a contemporary classical music ensemble in uh, in uh, Toronto, uh, run by Andrew Barashko, uh, a collection of songs by, uh, by other musicians, Elvis Costello and a bunch of others called The Singer Must Die. Uh, and then your first solo album, Page One. Um, uh, and a, a lot of the songs from that album and from the two that have followed are, are form the, 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 the set of music that is the basis for this new musical. Did you know from the outset that you were going to be uh, using this material for uh, a, a stage production? Well, the, so the last two records, um, Heal the Self, Part One and Two, um, are part and parcel with this here. Uh, uh, here's what it takes musical, but not all the songs on the records are in the musical and not all the songs in the musical are on the records. Um, but when I f- first started making these records, I had a ton of songs. I was becoming shockingly productive for me because sometimes it takes me a long time to come up with new material. And here I had, you know, over 20 songs and I felt like there was an arc and it wasn't just about me and my journey although it was certainly informed by that but i thought this journey feels like it's it could be applied to some a bigger story or another story or somebody else's story um so i went to anthony cimolino um, the artistic director at the stratford festival because i'd worked with him quite a bit doing um scoring for their classical plays and He'd said to me a bunch of times, when are you going to bring us a musical? And so I went to him and gave him the music I had at the time and said, I I feel like this is something. And I didn't know whether it was like a staged concert or, you know, it was, a, you know, was it a, a proto, like a American Utopia type staged concert or something like that? Or was it, you know, with some choreography or was it part of a narrative story? And so they got me to meet with a few different potential collaborators and I met Daniel McIver and we hit it off incredibly well. And he brought, you know, he listened to my story and my stories about anecdotes about my, my experience in a band and in a partnership. And that's really what the, what here's what it takes is about, is about a partnership. Um, It's two guys in a band 
uh, who start when they're kids, so much like me and Ed, but it's not the story of me and Ed. That, that, that was a great thing. If I had written it myself, I think I would have been trying to hide details uh, of my own life. But instead, it's like the details that are in there are much more like funny bits or unique bits that make things feel real and and ground the play in some reality. But the emotional life of these characters is a different one. And I love the fact that Daniel was able to find that in the songs that I already had. But then the most exciting thing for me was to be able to then go, oh, this character needs to say this and they need to say it in a song or we need to show this musical growth or whatever else over time. And then to write new songs for characters that I just met was a brand new thing for me and really exciting and, you know, end up coming up with some of the songs I'm most proud of that way. It's a very different discipline, right? Because when you're writing for an album, it's pretty clear that the I guy on the album is you, Stephen Page. When you're writing for a musical, you're writing for a persona, a character who's got this separate existence. And uh, people I know who uh, sing show tunes uh, say it's a, it's, a, it's a different headspace. Did it take time adjusting to that? Well, I've always written some songs that uh, were formed from the point of view of whether they were real life people or fictional characters, um, which is a hard thing to explain to some people. Like I think people do always assume that the I is Stephen Page. And sometimes it's not like sometimes I'm, I'm taking an element from my life and then writing a story around it that, that doesn't involve me. And that new character is the one who's singing this song. Or I would write songs that I would imagine would be almost like the soundtrack to a scene in a movie. It's not necessarily telling the whole story, but it's helping to illustrate it and support that story. Um, and I think there's always been a, a theatrical element in the way that I um, approach songwriting. Um, but, you know, the card there are cardinal rules in musical theater. Things like uh, the, the songs must uh, push the story forward. Um, you know, and there uh, these cardinal rules are obviously made to be broken and people don't always like it when somebody who's an outsider like myself breaks, seems like you don't know them, but I've learned them and they're super helpful. All rules to me are, are super helpful. Just like writing a pop song, like the idea of the structure of a pop song is precious to me. I, because then when I break it, I, it feels freeing. It feels exciting. And it feels like I'm able to. You know, when I take a left turn, um, I feel like that's on, that's always informed by knowing the rules. And that's the same thing. I'm learning new rules for musical theater. Um, and I think, you know, I went into this show with a bit of a chip on my shoulder. I think Daniel and I both did. Um, I love musical theater, but I've always had an issue with the way that rock music is portrayed on stage and in film and so on. I always feel people get it wrong. And this was my chance to get it right. Um, and I gave up on that part way through because like you start to kind of hit certain tropes in your storytelling and in the like the, the musical ideas and so on. And it doesn't mean that they're hackneyed. It just means that they're there because they work and they help your story and your characters get to the next place. And so what started as a bit of a I felt like a bit of a punk in a way about it by the end of this process, I feel like it's a love letter to the form of musical theater and what I've learned from all the other people who are teaching me about it while I work on it. Um, you, you go into it thinking, I'm gonna teach them a lesson, and then you realize that you've got a lesson to learn. Absolutely. And that's, you know, that's the thing is, I, what's kept me going uh, is my desire to keep learning. Um, whether it's, you know, I would be doing shows with, uh, with um, symphony orchestras and I'm getting some of the best arrangers in Canada to do symphonic arrangements for me. And, and I, I think it looks like hubris to me, but I said, I'm going to do a couple. Um, but it was only because I wanted to look at all these other ones and listen to other ones. And I'd done, you know, enough shows with, with orchestras and, you know, I'm a voracious listener of music and all the time I was spent on the road and recording and so on with the Art of Time Ensemble, starting to understand the beginnings of how an orchestra is voiced. And I wanted to try that. And so it meant I had to teach myself 
notation and teach myself the software to do it. And it was like countless hours, countless hours making these arrangements, but I'm super proud of them. Also because I, I feel like it's not like I've mastered something. It's like, now I have something else that I can keep learning and uh, a language that I can speak with other people and keep gathering new, new ideas and new tips. Um, we're uh, heading into the home stretch of this uh, wonderful conversation, and I'm happy to announce that that keyboard in front of you is not just a prop. We're <laughs> going to actually get you to uh, play a song that will be featured in the in the musical. Here's what it takes. Can you tell us about the song and then uh, and then take it away? Sure. So this is one of those songs, like I was talking about, where it was actually written for a character. Um, you know, even a character who I I don't even think it existed in our first draft of the show you know i think we're at 10 drafts now and uh this became a a major character he's uh the love interest of one so that the, there's a band walker roads uh, are the are the two guys and imagine them as being kind of like i am fascinated by this archetype of the the duo i mean obviously i was in a duo bare naked ladies started as that but it's particularly the kind of british synth pop duo uh, where they have this emotive, flamboyant lead singer and then a, uh, a silent scientist behind the keyboard. So whether it's Eurythmics or Soft Cell or even, you know, the American archetype is Sparks. Uh, mm. But there are tons of these, these bands. Um, so I kind of thought that's who they start as. Um, well, one of the characters is gay, and this, is in the, this takes place in the early to mid-80s at this point. And he's under a fair amount of pressure from his lover to come out. Uh, this is, you know, as, as the AIDS crisis is growing, um, he doesn't want to be uh, a spokesperson just because of his sexuality. But he has to, he has to make a choice. And this is a song that his lover, uh, Brent, sings to him hmm. called Where Do You Stand? Where do you stand? Where do you stand? Is that your brand? Bland? I don't understand you. So afraid to offend. You can't be everyone's friend. Because in the end, they'll always demand you stand there are men just like us who are dying because they are men just like us where do you stand where do you stand I think your band's fans Need a line in the sand if you're singing for them at 45 RPM. But you're scared they'll condemn you then. This can't be what you planned. You stand up for what you believe and the love you receive outweighs those who believe. What's it about the devoted devout? Well, they're gonna find out the doubt. Is your soul motivation? Get down off that cross. Show the world who is boss. Lose the glitz and the gloss, the dross, and alienation. If you stand for something, I can surely guarantee it won't be easy. Stick it out with me, and the only certainty is that you'll be loved for who you are, at least by me. How long can you? holding your breath when you know 
Silence equals death. Confess who you are and who you might be. Oh, where do you stand? Come on, be a man. Stand for something. Stand for something. Where do you stand? I know you can. For something, stand up for something. Wow, thank thanks very much for that, Stephen Page. Um, thank you. Uh, for that song from your upcoming musical, we don't know when it's upcoming, but it's upcoming. Uh, here's what it takes. Um, I think we're going to call it a night. Uh, it's been a bit of a bumpy ride, but uh, I want to thank everyone uh, for sticking with us. And Stephen, for being essentially the uh, our first ambassador from the world of the performing arts. Uh, I, I really enjoyed this conversation. Thanks so much. Me too. Thanks, Paul. Um, I also want to thank our sponsors at the Canadian Bankers Association, our eternal partners even here in virtual space at the National Arts Centre, uh, and all of you for sticking with us. We are going to be back next week with Alberta Premier Jason Kenney to talk about uh, his upcoming musical and maybe some <laughs> other stuff, too. Thanks very much from all of us here at McLean's Magazine. Good night.